Welcome to this soul-lifting broadcast which has been put together for your spiritual growth and to make greatness come on right where you are. Be sure to make the best of this moment as God takes the lead in all that concerns you. We're continuing our teaching series which we've tagged the honor code. The honor code. The honor code. This is the third in the, in the, in the series of teachings. We started out uh, by making everyone understand from the story of Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis that God demands honor from us and he expects that we honor him with who we are and what we have. Yeah. And that some things can honor God and some things can dishonor God. He told the story of Cain and Abel, how uh, Abel brought an offering and uh, in, in what he brought, God saw honor because it was the best, the first, and the best. Cain brought just something to God, and God rejected it. And God said, if you, if you do the right thing, will you not be accepted? We also spoke to the fact, I mean, concerning the, 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 the fact that there are three areas that we can honor God. Yeah, there are three areas that we can honor God. And that's in, in the area of our time, our talent, and our treasure. In the first message, we spoke more to our talent. Remember I was saying on Workers' Day as we commemorated that, that work is worship. My work must bring honor and glory to God so that when men see my excellent work, we say that excellence honors God and uh, uh, blesses people. Yeah. When you see excellence di displayed, Psalm 8 and verse number 1, the scripture says, O Lord our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And if his name is excellent, that means his person is excellent. And if you are a child of God, then the work of your hand should be excellent. Because God will hold you accountable for it. So walk, my walk, is part of my worship. Yeah, it's part of my worship. And we... Last Sunday, my wife brought a powerful message in this service last Sunday where she spoke to uh, the subject of how we honor God with our time. Our time. And we say that time is a convertible currency. You can convert it to anything. Time can be converted to a, a blissful marriage, a blessed marriage. Time can be converted to a fast-track career path. Time can be converted to a blessed business, booming business. Because when you see something where... Time has been invested, it always looks different from what has been neglected. Are you still with me today? So time is a convertible resource. And that God expects us to use our time to honor him. And that he's going to hold us accountable according to the parable of talent. That God holds us accountable as to how we use our time or how we invest our time, how we invest our talent, and then also how we invest our treasures. And the last uh, few messages of the series, we're going to be focusing more on the honor code as regards our treasure. Glory be to Jesus. So today I'm speaking to the subject of kingdom trustees. Kingdom trustees, that's what I call it. Kingdom trustees. It's important to know that a trustee is a person or a firm that holds an administrative properties or asset on behalf of another person. That's who a trustee is. And it's also important for you and I to get the mindset that if we will honor God with our substance, according to the scriptures, uh, in uh, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 9, where it says, Honor the Lord with your possession and with the first fruit of all of your increase. It says so, in, in verse 10, it says so, your barns will be filled with plenty and your vat will overflow with new wine. When you honor God with what God has given to you, the Bible says God blesses what you have when you honor God with what God has given to you. How do we honor God with our treasure? There's a mindset that must undergird my quest and your quest to honor God with your treasure. And that mindset is that of a steward or a trustee. A steward or a trustee. Let me digress. I'm going to come back into this, but let me digress a little bit. Earlier this year, 
we shared the word for this year. Yeah. We took it from Agai chapter 2 from verse number 6 down to 9. Agai 2 from verse 6 down to 9. As I was preparing for this message, God brought this back to my mind. Agai 2 uh, uh, from verse 6 down to 9. Wait, the, uh, uh, our anchor word for the year is greater. The fact that God wants to do greater things in your life and my life. And in Agai chapter 2 from verse 6, say, For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it's a little while, I will shake heaven and earth and the sea and dry land. And everything that can be shaken is being shaken right now. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Said that now, I will shake the nations and they shall come to, to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Said the silver is mine, the gold is mine. Says the Lord of hosts, uh, the glory of the latter temple. One translation says the latter house. We are the temple of the living God. We. Yeah. It's not talking about a building. We are the temple of the living God. Said the glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the former. Says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace. Says the Lord of hosts. So God says, after all the shaking, you are going to be better than what you used to be before. Can I get a better amen? amen? I say it one more time, as God has spoken to us this year, that there will be a shaking quite all right, but after the shaking, I, I will be in a better place than the place I used to be. It simply means, like I was saying at the online global workers meeting yesterday, I was reminding all of our volunteers and workers and leaders that we should not forget what God told us this year, that the shaking is going to be in our favor. That's what a guy 2 verse 6 to 9 says. That the shaking is in your favor. Yeah. That the shaking is going to be in your favor. He said, I will shake everything. The desire of all nations will come to me. I will shake the dry land, shake the seas, shake all nations. Yeah. But he said, the glory of the latter house, this latter temple, you and I, he said, it shall be greater than the former. Yeah. So the shaking is in your favor. I say after me, say the shaking is in my favor. Say it again, say the shaking is in my favor. But let's bring it down home to this message. Because the Holy Spirit helped me to make a connection. If you are the one in charge of shaking, and the shaking as an assets have been shaking, how will you rearrange it? You rearrange it so that it falls into the hand of your trustees. The people that you can, you can trust. <laughs> and your stewards, the people who uh, can steward your resources along the line of your own agenda. And if we as humans have enough sense to do that, then what do you think God will do? So when I say the shaking is in your favor, you need to understand that God expects you and I to reposition mentally and emotionally and spiritually so that this shaking, as it goes around, we will, it will not pass over you, but God will locate you. So there's a global redistribution of wealth that is going on. And one of the things that will help people to be able to position properly so that post pandemic, you are not left behind is first and foremost that you strengthen your dedication. Yeah. To the kingdom of God. Strengthen your dedication to the kingdom of God. You trust God to open your eyes and give you foresight to know how to position. And that you have a stewardship mindset, not an ownership mindset. A stewardship mindset, not an ownership mindset. Because the perspective of a steward is always diff diff different from the perspective of the owner. Is somebody stay with me here this morning? Very important. This message is about helping you to gain a different perspective, which is a perspective of a steward, a trustee, not the owner. I was saying, I was saying in the last service that uh, the car that I drive right now, when God blessed me with it, I started driving and uh, I was usually very careful, you know, just drive, you know, yeah, just try to enjoy it and drive safe. 
But you know, you all of us have our default setting, <laughs> which is you know the you know the way you drive. You know, when it's just you, and you just want to have fun and just just move, small. Mm. Yeah. One day I was driving on Tommy Lambert, not now, but long time ago. Yeah, I, was driving, I, I, I can't even remember the car I was driving there, but I was driving on Tommy Lambert, and somebody just overtook me, like anyhow, just. And I looked at the person and the car. I was like, how can some people be te testing the Lord their God like this? <laughs> how, can, how can you just be tempting somebody like this? Look at the car I'm driving. Look at the engine capacity. One small undercar. Just, I just said, let me just show him. That, that, uh, just, just to show that, uh, you know, humility is power under control. <laughs> so I just press on the gas a bit. Zzz, and the car moved. And uh, I made sure that I slowed down when I got close to the gas. <laughs> so you know that because we are not showing our power, that's not mean we don't have power. Yeah. And you know when you do that, you now put on your hazard light. Just to let the person know that you are gone. <laughs> Just to signal the person that I'm sure you, I'm sure you saw me. I'm gone. Yeah. But this is the point I'm making. I realize that whenever I, I drive myself most of the time, and sometimes I'm, I'm going out, and my executive assistant is with me, so he drives. And, you know, we just sit together and just as we're going or maybe I'm working or punching my paper or something. When he's driving me, he's extremely cautious. Yeah, he's extremely cautious. I have uh, uh, one of our volunteers also here, uh, Brother Lulu, <laughs> who also once in a while when he has time, we go, I mean, follows me on administration and maybe he's driving. Lulu is extremely cautious. Sometimes I'll be telling Lulu, move this thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know the mindset is that, look, this car is on my car. I want to handle it well. Yeah. That's why when you drive your car, it's not the same way you drive it when you're driving somebody else's car. Yeah. I hope you understand what I'm saying. There's the mindset of the owner and there's the mindset of the steward. They're not the same. The owner says, I own it. I can use it anyhow I like and I'm not accountable to anybody. The steward says, I don't own it. I have it. I'm in charge of it. But I'm going to be held accountable for how I use it. I will say it together. Let me give you a scripture. Paul was giving this mindset to the church at Corinth. Uh, in in 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when you read from verse 1. Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, when you read from verse 1 and 2, and he was selling a mindset to the church. He says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. We are not owners of these mysteries, we are stewards. And in verse 2 he says, moreover, it is required in stewardship. It is required in stewardship, in stewards, that one be found faithful. Yeah, verse 2, verse 2, quickly, quickly, don't waste time. Yeah. It is required in stewards that one be found faithful. So, the stewardship mindset says this. I'm a steward, I will be held accountable, and I want to be found faithful. Can we say that together, everybody? Say, I'm a steward, I will be held accountable, I want to be found faithful. One more time, I'm a steward. I will be held accountable. I want to be found faithful. That right there undergirds the mindset of a steward. That is the mindset of a steward. That right there is the mindset of a steward. And that was why Jesus spoke extensively not minding what the people of his days would say, he spoke a lot about money. The stewardship of our treasure. 
39 parables of Jesus, 11 are going to be about the stewardship of our treasure. He took his time to speak on stewardship of your treasure. In the parable of the eating treasure and pear, Jesus compared the kingdom of heaven to riches. And in the parable of talent, he tells a story of a master who entrusts his servant with money to make a point about being productive. In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, it drew our attention to a great eternal reversal where those who seem to be most comfortable on earth may find themselves not being that comfortable in the afterlife. And vice versa. Depending on our disposition to our treasure and the things that God will give us here or not. Why does Jesus care about money so much? It's because at the heart of Christianity lies the premise that God created everything and it ultimately belongs to him. He created everything and it ultimately belongs to him. Psalm 24 and verse 1. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and everything that dwells within it. Everything that dwells within it. God created everything and everything belongs to him. That's at the heart of this Christian faith. That presupposes that if I want to uh, obey the honor code for treasure, I must understand that I am a steward and not the owner. And ultimately, I will be held accountable and I want to be found faithful. 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 So stewardship involves a fundamental understanding of God as source of all and a commitment to faithful administration of all that God will provide for you and I. Yeah. A lot of the time we find out that people struggle. People struggle without understanding. People struggle. Christians struggle with the understanding of stewardship. Stewardship of our treasure. And it puts us in a place sometimes where we don't position to be found faithful. Rather than uh, trusting in God, we start to ponder, to, to fear, to, you know, to our sense of security being tied to something else. In fact, a lot of the time uh, when, when the devil wants uh, to help a believer to play to the gallery, we start to feel that our effort brought us everything that we have. We start to undermine the end of God, the favor of God, the faithfulness of God, and the effect of the covenant. Whenever you start to undermine the effect of the covenant, you start to go on the wrong side of God. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, when you read uh, uh, verse, verse, verse 7, for instance, it says, uh, uh, For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? He said, Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Many Christians have a way of thinking that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very smart. You know, I'm a brainy guy. I'm smart, you know. That's why things are happening. You know, I know God is good and all that, but, you know, uh, somebody has to be smart. <laughs> you know, all those kind of things. That's what people say. Yeah. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, when you read from verse 17 and 18, God said, when things start to work for you, Look away from this mindset that says it is by the power of your hand. So then you say in your hand, in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have brought gain, uh, uh, have gained me this world. He said, but instead of thinking like that, this is how to think, verse 18, and you shall remember. Somebody say, I will remember. Or oh, somebody say it again, say, I will remember. So that you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he might establish his covenant, which is saw to your fathers as it is this day. As it is this day. That he may remember the covenant which he saw to your fathers. It is the Lord your God that brings you the power to get wealth. 
is the Lord your God that brings you the power to get wealth. So there's a disposition that you and I must have about wealth, about our treasure, and the fact that we are stewards and not the owner. Jesus also underscored this mindset in Matthew chapter 6 from verse 19, or even from before then, where he said, look, don't, don't, don't worry yourself sick about things of this world. Matthew 6 and verse 19. Uh, can you bring it up for me, please? Quickly, quickly, quickly. And then he started to talk to people. He said, do not lay up treasures for yourself. Where moth and rust destroy. Jesus spoke to the fragility of the economic system of the heart. And the fact that, you know, you're not in control. And it's neither here nor there. Some people have slept and woke up and half of their assets has been devalued. Yeah. If you live in a country like Nigeria, the way Naira has been devalued in the last, uh, you know, few years, you just realize that uh, without you doing anything, you didn't offend anybody. <laughs> and the, the world system just takes away your money anyhow. Yeah, and some people say, I'll give you against time. God is asking for 10%. You put your money in stock market. I'm not saying you should not invest. I invest myself. I'm just saying that uh, I would rather trust God and obey him and, you know, <laughs> and see myself as a trustee, even ask him what to do with certain money. You understand? Then just push it as I like. Because those systems too cannot be trusted. And Jesus spoke to that here. He said, he, he said lay up your treasure in the place that is safe, where moth and rust does not corrupt. Yeah. And where you're going to spend eternity anyways, because Jesus was sell, selling a mindset here, which is the mindset that every African who migrates to maybe North America or Europe with the intention to come back home and retire in Nigeria must have. If you chop everything there, you won't meet anything when you get back after retirement. And he's saying that the time we're going to spend in eternity is going to be eternity forever. If you spend 150 years on earth, it's like split second compared to the time you're going to spend in eternity. And if you have an opportunity to send something back, to lay up your treasure there, Start through certain channels that the scripture opens up to us so that we, we are not confused as to how to, then you are in a, in a good place if you choose to embrace those channels. Glory be to Jesus. Next week, we're going to speak a little more to those channels and different ways, the channels of, 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 of blessings and different uh, ways that God expects us to lay up so that we can be blessed here and also still be blessed there. And that will be somebody's testimony in Jesus' name. Amen. But one thing that I wanted to really point out here this morning, at the end of this scripture that I read, Matthew 6, verse 19 and 20, in verse 21, Jesus did not mean word when he says, for where your treasure is, there your art will be also. That's where your heart will be. Also. Can you give me verse 22 also? Uh, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. That's where your heart will be also. Uh, uh, and it says that the, 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 the lamp of the body is the eyes. And if therefore, if therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. It's talking about your disposition. Your, your, how you gain your light from or where you gain your light from. But he said, but if your high is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if, there's, uh, if therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is your darkness? That's, that's what we should be saying to some people right now. Because some people have believed a lie concerning money as Christians. We have believed a lie. That's why he said, if your, uh, your high is bad, your worldview, your disposition, your belief system, if it's corrupt or if it's not correct, said, how great is your darkness? And in verse 24, that's where I'm going. He said, no one can serve two masters. For either you will hate one and love the other, or else it will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? Have you ever asked yourself the question before? Why Jesus did not say you, 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 you cannot serve God and the devil. I thought the devil is supposed to be the opposite of God. Why did he put mammon there? Yeah. Why money? It's because money in the practicality of life is one of the things that sway people away from the kingdom the most. 
Even when the devil is not around. Yeah. The devil is not around. It's money. It creates a channel you know, to the devil. That's why uh, the scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, I think when you read from verse 6, and you put that up, I'm digressing, but let's, let's get into it. It's just a good way to teach the word of God this morning. 1 Timothy 6, uh, give me from verse 6 quickly. Somebody help me, help me quickly, quickly. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we, will carry, we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with this we shall be content. But you know, like I always say, not contained, but content. But he said, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and harmful loss, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10 says, for the love of money is the pathway, the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Some have done what? Strayed away. From the faith in the last two or three years that people have stopped going to church just because of the social media opera about tithing about pastors taking people's money and about why nigeria you know is the poverty capital of the world and yet we're very religious and the churches are full but people are still poor and you know and all that and it's a combination of many problems but when the devil makes it look like the church is the only one that is culpable is to dissuade some of us from you know, uh, the perfect understanding of what is going on. The church definitely can do better and can do a lot better. Pastors can be more responsible. Pastors can be better stewards of God's resources. I agree. But the truth is that we, our system is riddled with bad corruption that disables development. Yeah. That's, that's, that's at the root of everything. I hope you understand what I'm saying. And some of that corruption crept into the church. At the same time, we can't shy away from that. That's part of our main problem as a nation. But to make it look like the power of God has been deactivated in a nation like Nigeria is a lie from the pit of hell. Because when people don't understand things, they look for who to blame. And then the next thing is to make believers feel like they are not responsible to God with their money. You can do anything. Some people even say, you, you know, you don't have to tithe. Instead of tithing, give your money to the poor. I'm going to break it down to you next week. There's a difference between giving to the poor and giving to God. There are two different things. They serve two different purposes. We should do both, but we should not neglect one for the other. Glory be to Jesus. There are two different things. We're going to dwell on that next week. But I need to just understand that wrong thinking will lead to wrong behavior. And when you behave wrongly and dishonor God, you cannot be excused. <laughs> yeah. Wrong thinking leads to wrong behavior. Wrong behavior cannot be excused. God is the God of mercy. But this world works based on the law of cause and effect. When I refuse to invest properly, when I refuse to do what I'm supposed to do, when I refuse to invest my time in the right thing, my treasure in the right thing, the effect of it, I will see it. But God remains faithful. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Glory be to Jesus. So, money amplifies what it means, meets in you, and seeks to become your God. Rather than you using your money to serve God and serve humanity, you start to worship the money. That's why Jesus said in you know, Matthew 6 and 24 there, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters. It's that you are loyal to one and neglect the other. Let me wrap this all up this morning. I want to show you two characters from the scriptures. Both of them have had, I mean, they had encounters with Jesus, but the encounters played out differently. And I hope that somebody's going to get something that will change your perspective and make you see yourself more as a steward so that the strangled hold of covetousness and spending everything you have on yourself and putting your trust in money can be broken over your heart today. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Let's check out these two characters. The first one is Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19. 
Luke chapter 19. Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19 from verse 1. The Bible says, Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And verse 2, Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Chief tax collector and he was rich. You know they work together, right? Yeah. Yeah. From time immemorial and in most countries of the world, you hardly find a poor chief tax collector. Yeah. There's a spirit in the tax office. <laughs> Praise God. The man was rich. And he sought to see Jesus. To see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd. For he was a short, sta of st short stature. Verse 4. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him. For he was going to pass that way. Verse 5. And when Jesus came uh, to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must dwell in your house. But look at verse 5. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And some of uh, the Bible says, and when they saw it, some of the Pharisees and all those religious people, they complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And you know, Jesus loves sinners. And verse 8, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord. Now, and I want to pause here to say this. Leave that scripture up there for me. Zacchaeus had an encounter with Jesus. That encounter did something to him. It broke the hold of covetousness, trusting in money, living for money, and all that. Just as he met Jesus, and Zacchaeus said this to Jesus, I sell half of everything, plus the one I had and the one I stole, and I give everything to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone unjustly, I will refund it fourfold. What Zacchaeus was saying was this. I know I have money. But now that I want to be with you, money will not rule my life. I will rule the money. And I will use it for the right purposes. Are you still with me today? That's exactly what Zacchaeus said there. And Jesus, the Bible said, said to him in verse 9, Today, what happened? Can somebody help me this morning? What happened today? Yeah. He said, today salvation has come into your house. Jesus looked at him and said, wow, this is a real encounter. Something has broken loose in this guy's heart and salvation has come to you. True salvation has come to you. You know, it was Reverend Martin Luther uh, that said there are three conversions. The conversion of the heart. The conversion of of the mind and then the conversion of the wallet or the purse. <laughs> and that every believer must go through these three conversions. One is at the instant of meeting Christ. The other one is a lifelong journey. According to Romans 12 and, and verse 2, and be not conformed to this word, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's a conversion of your mind. But the third one is an encounter that we all need to have based on a certain understanding of stewardship. A certain understanding of stewardship. Let's look at the second character. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. I want you to keep at the back of your mind the encounter of Zacchaeus. We're going to compare it with this other guy's encounter. Mark chapter 10 from verse 17. Mark 10 from verse 17. Mark 10 from 17. The Bible said, Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. Verse 19, You know the commandment, Jesus told him. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Obviously, the guy was a church boy. Yeah. And as he been using his church mind, like we said. Like we say all the time. And you know, he said, the Bible says in verse 20, he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Mr. Church boy. Yeah. He said, For my youth, I've been doing all these things. Jesus, the Bible says, looking at him, loved him. How would you love somebody 
who has been straight. The only problem is that with all his straightness, he is still serving mammon. Let's look at it. Jesus looked at it and loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, maybe you got that by the Spirit. Say, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come, take up the cross and follow me. This was a test. Jesus was just testing him to see, to gauge his level of trust in his money. Whatever you cannot walk away from is your master. <laughs> Can I say that one more time? Whatever you can walk away from is your master. Whatever you can walk away from, you have mastered for the rest of your life. Yeah. So whether it's a relationship, whether it's money, you know there are some people here, you're in an abusive relationship and you cannot walk away. That thing has become your object of worship. Yeah. Whatever you cannot walk away from is your master. Whatever you can walk away from, you have mastered for the rest of your life. Jesus told this guy, or asked him, can you walk away from your money? So we know that the hold of covetousness and trust in money has been broken over your life. And we can categorize you as a kingdom trustee or steward. But look at what happened after Jesus told him, go and sell everything, walk away from it, and come and follow me. The Bible says in verse 22, but he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possession. Can we read it a different way? But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful because great possession had him. And held him back from Jesus and from being a kingdom steward. That's what happened there. You can imagine, after listening to Jesus, the man was saying, ah, I was thinking about uh, his real estate in London, thinking about uh, his domiciliary account, and Bank of America account, and uh, he was saying, uh, no, no, not today, Jesus. Another time. And he walked away. He walked away. Zacchaeus did not even allow Jesus to say much. <laughs> he just said to demonstrate to you that now that I've met you, uh, uh, I, I, I can feel the presence of God. Something is happening in my heart right now. I have a conviction that my life has been too much about money. Yeah. I have lied about money. Maybe Zacchaeus have even killed for money. You know, done all kinds of things. He said, no, 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 no. I can't follow you like this. To be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, you have to be a steward. You have to be somebody whose asset God can use, God can call upon at any time. You have to be absolutely dependent on God and fully dedicated to him. Next week, we're going to break it down a little more for you to understand that God will not ask you to go and sell everything all the time. Yeah, because he gives bread to the eater and seed to the sower. I'll break that down next week. God recognizes that you need bread. And bread there means many things. So that somebody doesn't leave this service, you need to come next Sunday. And here, part of it, the pastor of Elevation said, uh, God will tell you to go and sell everything. Yeah, sell all your possession and come. No, no, no. I don't want to see that on any blog tomorrow. <laughs> all right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, we're going to get to the part two, the second part of this next week. And I need you to, to be around to, to hear it out. But what I'm saying today is that like Abraham, if God demands your Isaac that you waited for for years, and after Isaac came, he said, send Ishmael that you got by crooked means away so that you can focus on me. And then I now focus on you and you now say, bring the Isaac. God was testing Abraham to see is Isaac, now your object of worship or me. So if I demand that thing that you're all, almost getting emotionally entangled with to worship me with it, will you worship me with it? Will you worship me with it? If God demands your Isaac, will you be able to say, I'm a steward? It doesn't belong to me anyway. Take it. Because Abraham told Isaac, told his servant, he said, you stay here. Time will not permit me to get into that. Say, I and the Lord, this Isaac will go forward and will worship. And what he meant was that I'm going to offer him. You know, it takes a circumcised believer to have a stewardship mindset. So that you won't be like that young rich ruler that walked away from God because he could not let go 
of material things. This season, God may demand from some of us to rededicate ourselves to him by doing something, by, you know, uh, uh, walking away from something, by changing the way you spend your time, by, uh, you know, uh, changing uh, your art of dedication, even in the way you use your talent for God, you know. Uh, 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 because some people have been saved now almost forever, but you don't do nothing that we can trace on how your talent aids soul winning and prospering the kingdom of God. We cannot trace how a percentage of your income finds its way to ministry activities and practical ministry and soul winning. There's a time for you to reverse it. Forget about the noise in our world. It's to confuse people. The honor code is still alive and well. They that honor me, I will honor. They that likely despise me, I will despise. Lift your two hands to Jesus this morning and say, Lord, give me grace. Give me grace to walk with you. Give me grace to walk with you this season. Thank you for listening. We hope you are truly blessed. Please feel free to email us at info at elevationng.org for all inquiries or to share any testimonies. You can also follow us on our social media channels at ElevationNG to have access to real-time updates on all broadcasts and special programs. Till we come your way again, keep making greatness common.